Welcome to uh, Why Color Management Absolutely Sucks. It's not you, and I hope this presentation reinforces that. Um, my name is Jacob. I have a YouTube channel, uh, Inlight VFX, and so I mainly use Blender to add VFX to live action footage like this. Um, this is a, a shameless plug for a new Blender VFX course I'm working on. It's, uh, you can pre-order it on Kickstarter if you look up Blender VFX Kickstarter. Um, but yeah, this is the, the type of work I do with Blender. So VFX work, color management is really important, but even if you're doing fully CG stuff, uh, it impacts everything. So how many of you in this room are, are unfamiliar, a little uncomfortable with color management? Okay, yeah, good bold people out there raising your hands. How many of you feel pretty comfortable like you're rocking it? Nice. Okay, cool. Well, everyone in here is somewhere on a path between knowing nothing about color management and being a total color management god. And uh, this is the only AI-generated art in this presentation, but I was just too curious to see what that would look like. Um, now, there's, I, I'll be the first to say that I don't, few people make it to the god tier of color management, and that's okay. You, you probably don't need to get there, and you, you really don't want to get there uh, with what you have to go through, probably. Um, but there is a sweet spot in the middle here where you, you know enough to work more confidently. Uh, so my hope in this presentation is to get you closer to that sweet spot. Uh, so today, the first half of the presentation is going to be kind of flying through the fundamentals of color management. I'm going to go really quick, um, maybe have time for some questions, we'll see. But hopefully, if, if anything goes too quick, we have the recording. And then for the second half of this workshop, uh, I'm going to we're gonna make a visual effects shot together um, and then do some color grading to see how those fundamentals are, are put into practice in Blender and in DaVinci Resolve. So again, if you uh, wanna download those files and, and try to follow along, like I said, we're gonna be speeding through this, but uh, yeah, those are there for you. So what is color management? I'm gonna ex explain this in 15 seconds if I can. Uh, we have a program that we're working in. We have colors that go into that program. We do work on those colors, and then some colors come out of the program. Uh, repeat this over and over for all the programs you use in a project, and this is color management. So thank you so much, and have an amazing <laughs> conference. <laughs> uh, OK, so let's make this a little bit more concrete. Uh, I created this render, which will represent the output colors from our program which we'll be working in uh, Blender. And then we can think of the input colors as this image texture, and this one is the, the, the diffuse map. And then we have these arrows which go between these, these different phases. Um, now, one reason color management sucks is that out there in the real world around us, color does not exist. Color only exists when light waves enter your eyes and your brain interprets that signal as color. Um, so it's color is all in your head. Uh, another way we could think about this is light waves that are captured by a camera, which goes to a display, which emits light, which then you see with your eyes, um, and that's color. Now, one other unfortunate thing about color management is that often these different things do not work with the same colors. Uh, so the colors I see with my eyes will be slightly different than the colors you see with your eyes, than this camera, that camera, this display, that display. Uh, so we need some way to define the colors that each of these things are working with so that they can all work together harmoniously. And so we use a color space, which in the most basic definition defines the colors that something works with. So as we go through the presentation, we're going to update this graphic uh, to be more accurate. So instead of just saying colors, let's call each of these things uh, a color space. And I've named these randomly A, B, and C. Um, but you can notice they're all different from one another. Um, which is another reason color management is kind of sucky, uh, but there's a really good reason for that. And to understand why this is the case, uh, let's, let's talk more about what a color space is. So a color space has three components, a gamut, a transfer function, and a white point. We're just going to talk about gamut and transfer function for today. Um, so gamut describes the range of colors in a color space. Some really smart scientists created this diagram. Um, and this colored area here represents the, the colors that the average human eye can see. And so we still use this diagram to get, uh, today to draw out the gamuts of different color spaces. So we can see this triangle for color space A, and the colors within the triangle represent uh, the colors that can be in color space A. Similarly, we have a larger gamut in, in color space B. There's more colors 
that can be represented by color space B. So we have large gamuts and small gamuts. Uh, the benefit or the pro of having a larger gamut is just having more color data to work with. Uh, the pro of a smaller gamut is a smaller file size. Um, so there's not one, the point being there's not one right color gamut to work in. Um, transfer functions describe how luminous values are mapped in a color space. Now, what the heck does that mean? Well, let's look at this graph. On the x-axis, let's think about the power uh, of a light. And on the y-axis, let's measure the luminance output of that light with this light meter. This is a tool um, you might see used on like a film set to measure the output of, of lights. So let's say we turn on one light bulb and we, our light meter measures this much output from the light. So we have this point here. If we turn on another light bulb or, or double the, the power of our light, we expect to get double the output. And so we, this sort of intuitive relationship just keeps going every light bulb we turn on. And so if we connect these points, we get a line. And so this sort of, again, intuitive relationship between input and output values is called a linear transfer function. And this reflects how light works in the real world. It's, this is like basic math. And so we like linear transfer functions for rendering and compositing when we want to have realistic light calculations. But of course, color management can't be easy. So let's think about uh, light and then compared to how our eyes perceive brightness because our eyes are, are really funky. Um, so let's say we turn on one light bulb, we might notice a large change in brightness. But if we turn on another same exact light bulb, we're actually gonna see a smaller change in brightness. In fact, every light bulb we turn on, uh, as the environment gets brighter, our eyes are going to perceive a smaller and smaller change in brightness, even though our change in luminance each time is the same. And so now if we connect these points, we don't get a line, we get this nasty curve. So I like to think of our eyes as throwing like a curveball in color management. And so this is called a nonlinear transfer function. Um, and the, the, to summarize how our eyes work, uh, our eyes are more sensitive to changes in brightness in dark environments uh, than in light environments. And we know this intuitively. If I turn on this light at night, we see a large change in brightness. But if I turn on the same light during the daytime, we notice very little change in brightness. Even though technically the change in the amount of light or the change in luminance is the same, our eyes just have a, a really unique and tech, uh, really cool way of uh, kind of processing brightness. So we have linear and nonlinear transfer functions. Uh, some, there's a lot of different types of nonlinear transfer functions. Um, the benefit of linear transfer functions is that they give us realistic light calculations. So again, we like them for rendering and compositing. The pro of nonlinear transfer functions is that they mimic how our eyes perceive brightness. So we like to use them when storing or displaying image data so that it's more optimized to look good for our eyes. Um, and so we have large, small gamuts, linear, nonlinear transfer functions, and we can mix and match these to create many different types of color spaces. And here are just four hypothetical ones. Um, so each of these has their own advantages and disadvantage, disadvantages. And so that's why in this graphic here, we have different color spaces at different steps because depending on the files or the program that we're working on, we might wanna have some of those different characteristics for the color uh, spaces. So when we have two color uh, spaces that are different from one another, like with different gamuts or different transfer functions, they're automatically going to be at war with one another, which we don't like. So this is where we need some sort of mediator in color management to translate between different color spaces. And that comes in the form of the color space transform or CST for short. The CST takes different color spaces and makes them at peace with one another. Uh, so it, it will convert color data from one gamut and transform it into a different gamut. And it will take luminance values which are mapped to one transfer function and transform them to a different transfer function. And so that's what our uh, arrows are in this uh, diagram. They are color space transforms. And there's a specific color space transform that would take us from color space A to B, and another unique one that would take us from B to C. So we love color space transforms. They're at the heart of color management. Uh, oh yeah, if you, yeah, that's just a, no, a reminder if you wanna download the files. Um, so let's update this graphic. Instead of just saying color space, each of these should have a specific name of the color space and a gamut and a specific transfer function. So these question marks are all the things 
we have to kind of figure out when we're figuring out a, a color managed workflow. Uh, the color space of our input working and output, and then we want to know how our program that we're working in handles color space transforms in and out of it. Um, so let's start with the input color space. Now, so far I've shown this uh, image texture, and this is the diffuse map of our image texture um, for the TV. But we also have normal roughness and metallic maps. Now, for the diffuse map, it actually impacts the color of our material. And similar types of maps are color and albedo, and there's other ones. But these types of uh, texture maps have the sRGB color space most often. Um, so that has the sRGB gamut and a, a nonlinear transfer function. Um, but for maps like normal and roughness, this is purely numerical data stored as an image. And it, so we don't see the visual output of these maps in our material. And so in Blender, we assign this uh, a non color color space, which is not really a color space, but it's a way to tell Blender, hey, this is just numerical data. Don't assign any transformations to it. And so similar types of maps are bump, displacement, and AO. Um, so now we figured out, at least for our diffuse material, we're usually using the sRGB color space. Now let's talk about what working color space does Blender use. Um, and this is surprisingly difficult to figure out. Um, so you might come into the Blender manual and read the, you know, it's a riveting read here on the color management page. Uh, just snuggle up one night with this, with this page. It's really nice. Um, I'll tell you the, the only sentence here that I could find that really tells you what the working color space in Blender in uh, is, is this sentence. Uh, so the reference linear color space used in Blender is the linear color space with Rec. 709 chromaticities and D65 white point. Now, to most of us, that's uh, a foreign language. Um, so reference linear color space means the working color space. And Rec. 709 chromaticities is telling us that we're using the Rec. 709 gamut. And linear color space tells us that we're using a linear transfer function. So if we piece that together, we're using the, the linear Rec. 709 uh, color space to work in, in Blender. And this has, again, this has that linear transfer function, which is the most important part of this, uh, to give us that realistic uh, light calculations for rendering and compositing. So now let's talk about how Blender handles the input color space transform, because we see our color space between our texture and our working color space are different. So we need some way to convert between those. And so if I come into our, uh, the Blender file here, everything is scaled a little bit differently because of the screen, but here is my uh, image texture node for the diffuse map. And you can see for color space, I've chosen sRGB because that's what the diffuse map should usually have assigned to it. Uh, but what exactly is this setting doing? Because it's kind of interesting to think about. Well, behind the scenes, this uh, option here for color space is defining a color space transform between whatever color space we choose and the working color space of Blender. So in this case, linear Rec. 709. So if I choose whatever color space I choose, that's going to define the color space transform. And that's, you can access the same setting in the image editor. If you press N to come over into the right tab, you'll see this color space here. And these settings are linked pretty much anywhere in Blender where you're, uh, you have this color space option for an image or footage. This is defining a color space transform. So now we know how Blender handles that, that color space transform. Um, let's talk about output color space. And there's, there's two different ways you can think of output color space. We can think of the color space that we want to see on our display while we work, and also the colors that we want to embed in a file that we export. So we have, we'll further break this apart into display and export. And we also should think about how Blender handles the color space transforms for each of these, because they're kind of unique. So the display color space, in most cases, you're going to select sRGB, because most monitors use the sRGB color space. If that's not the right one for your monitor, then you prob probably already know what the right one is. Um, so let's talk about how Blender handles. Again, we have a different color space that we're working in versus displaying in. So we need to talk about how Blender handles that color space transform between them. And so our working color space is Linear Rec. 709. And this is what our image looks like in Linear Rec. 709. And it looks pretty awful. And that's because linear color data is never going to look correct on a display without so, some sort of color space transform 
uh, to convert that data to look good on a display. So we come into Blender in the Render Properties uh, tab here, all the way at the bottom, we have the Color Management dropdown. And I wanna focus on these first two options, Display Device and View Transform, because these two options define certain things about this, this color space transform here. So this Display Device tells us what color space we're going to be converting into. So if we choose sRGB, our output will be in sRGB. View Transform defines the method that we're using to convert the color data from one color space to the other. So there's one method called standard. And this, this might be a confusing concept to understand. So think about it this way. Say we have a long line and we want to make it a line, a shorter line of this length. So we want to go from long to short. One method to do this, we could call it the chop method. So we could just chop off the extra length of the line and we, the, the line looks like that. But we could also use something called like the squish method, and we could squish that line down to be that new length. And both of these are valid ways to you know, shrink the line down, but they have very different results. So similarly, view transform is just defining different ways to get from one color space to another. So standard is uh, an option in Blender, and it does, usually doesn't look very good because it doesn't handle uh, high dynamic range images very well. It'll clip your highlights. Um, so that's why we have other view transforms that you know work differently. So we have Filmic, which handles highlights better, AGX, Kronos. All of these have a little bit different aesthetic look. Um, and the right one is is technically you know the one you like best and whichever works best for your project. So I'll stick with AGX for now. Now there's one other setting here that I want to talk about, which is look. Um, and the look setting applies some sort of uh, artistic adjustment to your image before it goes through the color space transform. So if I set this to something like punchy, we see our output just has a little bit of added contrast there. Again, this is purely aesthetic. There's not one right look to select. So now we understand how Blender handles this, this color space transform to our display. Let's now talk about the export color space. And I'm going to come back to this graphic because at different points as we work, uh, you know, making a project, we will be making file exports. So between programs that we're working in, I call these uh, intermediate exports. And at the very end of all our workflow, I'll call this a final export. And it's a very important distinction to make between these because as a general rule of thumb, when you're making a file export that's going to be then ingested into another program, so an intermediate export, we want to be working in a color space that has a larger gamut and a linear transfer function. This is going to preserve as much color and luminance data as we work between different programs. Then only at the very end of our workflow, say we're making a, an export for YouTube or social media, do we want to then compress this color and luminance data down to a specific display? So that's why we want to think about what type of export we're making. Um, so I'll split these into those two categories. Now, if we're making an intermediate export, it's often going to be in the same color space that we're working in. So in this case, Linear Rec 709. And for final exports, it's often going to be the same that you're displaying in. So sRGB, if you're uploading to like social media, uh, that sort of thing. But there's a lot of different output color spaces. If you wanted to go to a, a movie projector, it would be very different. But to simplify this, we'll just say sRGB for final exports. And now let's talk about how Blender handles the color space transform to our export files. So there's a lot of different formats we can export in Blender. And though it's not explicitly stated, uh, Blender kind of categorizes these into two types. There's final export formats and intermediate exports. Um, and that's each of these have different default color settings that will go with them. So remember, for our display transform, we had these sort of color processes happening. Now, by default, Blender is going to apply these settings to any final export file types, and these are not going to be applied to intermediate export file types. So what the heck does this mean? Well, say I choose a, a export format of PNG, which Blender considers a final export, like you're going to upload straight to Instagram then Blender is, by default, is going to apply these color space transforms to our image and store them in the file. But if I choose an output type like OpenEXR, which is Blender considers an intermediate uh, format, then these transforms are not going to be applied by default, and our output file will be in the linear Rec. 709 color space. Um, 
So we can see that in Blender. If I go to the Output Properties tab and I choose a format like PNG, which is, again, considered a final output, final export, um, then in this Color Management dropdown, we see Follow Scene is set by default. And this is just going to copy all of those color settings that we've set here. So say I change this to grayscale, then it's just going to be updated here. And we can override these for our output file if we want to. But if I choose a file format like OpenEXR, if I'm going between Blender and another program, and I'm going to do more work on this file, then we see Follow Scene. There's, there's nothing showing here. Um, and that's kind of showing you that there's no uh, transformation happening. That file is just going to have the same color space that you've been working in, so linear Rec. 709 in this case. And so now we understand how Blender handles that uh, export color space transform. And so these are all the things we figured out in, uh, in 20 minutes, but that took me about four years. Um, and oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And so uh, one of the unfortunate parts of color management is that every program is going to implement at least these middle things differently. So you kind of have to figure this out um, for, for every program in your, in your workflow. But let's go into the uh, workshop portion of this, this time together. So we're going to take some footage that I filmed. Uh, this is filmed uh, in a log format, so that's why it looks kind of flat. If, for those of you that know uh, what a log format is. So we'll learn how to transform this into the proper color space. Then we'll render out some VFX elements. We'll composite those together. And then we'll go into DaVinci Resolve for some final color grading. Um, yeah, so if you have the files, we're going to begin. Uh, does anyone have any questions so far? OK, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question is, uh, are OpenEXRs, can they work for video and photo, is what you're, or like a, a still render, is what you're asking? No. More than how, how, how are you having, do you have any problems with color based effects of your uh, output? Because it's very high in OpenEXR, and you have to have some specificity. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've never gone to print. Uh, I think that that's mainly, yeah, you're talking about the, the, the color space transform to, yeah, some color space that might have a smaller gamut, lower bit depth. Um, let's talk more about that afterwards, because I also will probably hand you off to someone that's more qualified to answer that. Um, okay, I'm going to just get into this, this workshop, because... We have to keep flying along, but if you have questions, feel free to uh, stop me afterwards. So you can open this main demo start file if you're following along. Um, and let's come into the rendered view. And so I will, let's first bring in our background footage. So I'm going to click on the camera object and come into the uh, camera properties tab. And under background images, make sure this checkbox is checked and click open. And then we will open in the assets folder. I have my footage, which again I said is in the vlog v gamut color space. So we'll open this. And then in our color space setting, we want to select vlog v gamut uh, because we want Blender to transform our footage into linear Rec. 709. So I'm looking for that here. And it's, you know, spoilers, it's not a color space you can choose in the default Blender. So that's why we're going to come into DaVinci Resolve, because DaVinci Resolve has a lot more uh, functionality in terms of color spaces and color management. So what I would do is drag my footage into Resolve. And by the way, I'm just using the default 
uh, color management settings in Resolve. I'll drag this into the timeline. This is my log footage in Vlog Vgamut. I'll come into the color space tab. And then here, I want to add an effect in our effects library called color space transform because we want to transform this color space. So input color space here, this option, and this is you know getting back to uh, why color management is hard because input color space here, I think should technically be called input gamut. Because like we said, a gamut is part of a color space. So I think DaVinci Resolve, a, a, you know, a software made for color is mislabeling this setting, if you ask me. So that... Yes, the log, the V log V gamut. Yep, that's the one that I have here. Um, so our, our gamut is going to be Panasonic V gamut and our input gamma. And again, here, I think a better label would be input transfer function because gamma is, is technically a, a type of transfer function. So input gamma or transfer function is going to be Panasonic V log. And then uh, output color space. What do you think I'm going to use here? Does anyone want to guess? Yes, but what type of Rec. 709? Yeah. Linear, exactly. Nice. So our gamut is going to be Rec. 709, and our output gamma, or transfer function, is going to be linear. And I want to make sure I don't have any of this tone, tone mapping turned on. And now our footage looks awful, uh, but again, this is we're looking at linear color data, and so that's never going to look good on your display without the proper transform. But this is what we want, so we can come to our uh, export tab, we can choose an export type like EXR because, again, this is an intermediate export. We're going to take this file into another program and work on it. I like to use the DWAA codec, and then you would just name your file here and add it to the render queue and hit render. And so then, after we do that, we come back into Blender, exit out of this old footage, and I've already created this for you. Uh, so you can just open footage, linear rec 709. And now we, uh, our footage is in the right color space. So by default, it is, it is selected correctly there. Make sure your opacity is all the way up. Now still, this footage is not looking very good. And that's because by default, uh, the view transform being applied to this footage, this background uh, image here, is the standard view transform, which again, doesn't handle highlights very well. So that's where we want to click this view as render box. And that is going to use whatever view transform we have selected here. So you'll see if I change this to standard and I go back to our footage uh, settings, if I check and uncheck this, it doesn't change because that's the default. Um, so yeah, we want to use something like AGX probably. And now let's turn on our VFX environment collection. In this collection, I've just created some objects to basically catch the shadows of these uh, objects here. But we don't want to render out the full objects themselves. We just want to catch the shadows. So we'll click on this object, go into the Object Properties tab, twirl open this visibility setting, and then enable the shadow catcher. And this is going to turn that geometry into just uh, a shadow catcher. And then in the View Layer Properties tab, we want to also enable the uh, shadow catcher render pass. And then we would render this out. And we would let that do its thing. Um, any other questions while this renders? I know. I'm sorry. This is, uh, this is way too fast for having you follow along. So, um, But hopefully, again, if you watch the video again, it can, you can follow along then. It's done, but you can ask it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we just used Resolve at the beginning because uh, Blender didn't have the right color space to transform, uh, the right color space transform for our footage. So we used Resolve to, to transform it into Linear Rec. 709, which is Blender's default color space. And then when we load that into Blender, we have to choose Linear Rec. 709. Technically, there's no color space transform happening at that point. Oh, 
Oh, currently? Oh, so yeah, let me continue. This might answer your question. Um, so now this is finished rendering. I would save this out. Um, oh, let's click on our main. Oh, it's still rendering. Okay, well, let me cancel that. Uh, okay, now I can save it. So I'd save as, and again, this is an intermediate export. So I'd choose something like OpenEXR. Actually, in this case, I'll choose OpenEXR multi-layer uh, because we have multiple render layers happening. And I would choose a, yeah, I would just name this and save it out. I've already done this for you. It's called the Render TV VFX Layers. And then let's come into compositing. How am I doing on time? OK, we're doing pretty good. Um, we'll come into the compositing tab here. Make sure the backdrop is enabled. Let's delete this node. And by the way, you can hit V to zoom out of this backdrop, hold Option, and then middle click to pan this around. Or if you select the viewer, you can pan this around that way. Um, and then Option and V will zoom this in. Kind of, kind of clunky, but it works. Um, so let's input our background footage first, which is already loaded into Blender. So we'll just click on footage, linear rec 709. And again, we see that same color space setting here on this node that is defining a color space transform. Um, then let's bring in our VFX elements. So that's going to be our render VFX layers. We will click on the main render layer. And now we see all our different render passes. And if I hit Control Shift, and I click on these, I can see what those are. So we have our, our main elements in that shadow catcher. And then again, our color space here, since we exported a, an EXR, this is the correct color space to choose because, uh, yeah, that's, that's by default going to be the color data uh, saved out from Blender is linear rec 709 for, for a, an EXR file. So the compositing here is pretty simple. We'll go, we'll add a mixed color node and we're just going to composite in our shadows first. So we'll choose the multiply um, blending mode. And I, I hate doing things without explaining why I'm doing them, but there's not enough time to explain why I'm doing everything. Uh, our background footage needs to be scaled, actually, because I rendered our VFX elements at 8 in HD, and our background footage is in 4K. So I'll add a little scale node there. And then to add our other VFX elements on top. I'll use an alpha over node, make sure this is plugged into the bottom, and then whatever you wanna go on top will go in that top node. And that's, that's the basic composite there, pretty straightforward. And you know, you could finesse this, and I would maybe take down the saturation on these shadows a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the, the composite. So. If I were to save this out now from Blender, since I'm done with compositing, I would, there's many ways to do this, but you could click view render. And if I uh, look at the viewer node, this is going to show me only the stuff plugged into this node. So this is one way to save this out. I would just say save as. And again, if we're doing more work on this composite, and I'm gonna bring this into Resolve to do color grading, then this is technically an intermediate export or that that's the way I like to think about it. So I wanna keep using a file format like OpenEXR to store this, this large gamut in uh, linear color data. Um, and so I've already saved this out. It's called um, Render TV VFX Comp, it's that one there. So coming into Resolve, what I would do now, if, if we're doing some color grading, I'll bring in this, this render and I'll also bring in this render that I made of the TV in that studio environment that I showed earlier in the presentation. And I'll just drag these into the timeline. And I'll go into the color tab. Now, again, this looks really bad because we're, we're looking at linear color data. So I need some sort of color space transform to my display. So now in this case, what am I, yeah, I'll, I'll quiz you guys. What am I gonna choose for my input uh, gamut and transfer function now. Linear exactly. Yep, so it's going to be linear rec 709. So our gamut is rec 709, and our gamma, or transfer function, as I think it should be labeled, 
is linear. And then output color space can be something like sRGB. And we can choose sRGB for the uh, transfer function, or we could choose gamma 2.2. Um, make sure this apply forward OOTF is checked. And then by default, you might see something like this with, if the tone mapping is set to none. And we see our highlights are being clipped. And this is a very similar, this is a similar scenario, scenario to if we're working in Blender with that standard view transform. Uh, we're using a, uh, a transform that doesn't really account for our bright areas of our, our composite. So we need something in Resolve uh, to kind of map those highlights. And so we don't have the exact same transforms available uh, by default in Resolve, but Resolve does have this tone mapping functionality. And a common one that I choose is DaVinci. And if I use custom max output and take this all the way up, that helps uh, compress our luminance values into a uh, range that works on our display. Um, and so, yeah, you could leave it there, but of course that would be pointless. We're here to do some color grading. Um, so what I'll do, there's actually a color space that works better to color grade in. Like, remember I said, different color spaces have their own advantages and disadvantages. And so a really good color space to grade in, if I uh, hit Shift S, I can add a node before the one that I've selected, and I'll just copy and paste my color space transform to the beginning. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come into a color space called DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate, and I'm going to turn off the tone mapping. And so this first one, we'll just label this CST in. And I'm using DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate because this is a, a better color space for color grading in. And then at the end here, instead of Rec. 709 Linear, I'm gonna change this to DaVinci Wide Gamut and Intermediate, and I'll keep these settings. So essentially, we're going, we're taking our color data from Linear Rec. 709 into, into DaVinci Wide Gamut. That's whatever, that's the color data we get to use in the middle here for color grading. And then at the very end, we have the color space transform out to our display, sRGB. So then I can just go in here, um, you know, maybe I'll add some exposure. I like to add nodes for every adjustment. You can add them all on the same node or separate nodes. Um, maybe I'll add some saturation and then maybe some contrast. Okay. And then at the end, we can do a little bit of a glow. But we're doing all of these things in that DaVinci wide gamut color space before we go to this uh, transform. That's kind of the important part of this. And so I've already uh, actually done a better color grade, which I'm just going to copy here. I'll cheat a little bit. Um, and so that's, that's our final grade there. And you can hit, if you select some nodes, let's see, with shift, or actually that's command or control, and then you hit command or control D, you can turn them on and off to kind of see what your, your color grade is doing. And so now we're at the end of our, our color workflow. And so now we're ready to make a final export. And so we would come into the export uh, render, export tab, whatever this is called. And now we would choose a final output uh, format, something like MP4, PNG, and we would be saving these colors uh, as we're seeing them here or potentially in a different color space. If you're going to display this in a movie theater, there'd be specific ones that you can work with. But the nice part of having our files so far working in a, uh, a color, space, color space with a large gamut and linear transfer function is that we've preserved all that data. And so now at the end, if we want to make an export for a movie theater, and also we want to export the same project for social media, and also for a billboard, like we can, we can, we have all that color data. And so we can channel it into each of those color spaces a lot better than if we had, you know, compressed that color data down at an earlier step in our, uh, our workflow. So yeah, that's, that's all I have for today. Um, I guess we have 10 more minutes, which is crazy. Cause when I practiced this, I was over time. Um, so I must have flown really fast, which I'm sorry about, but hopefully, um, yeah, let's just take some more questions and you're also welcome to 
walk up to me afterwards. Uh, but thank you guys for listening. Any... In the, oh, here. So if you. It comes later? Oh, grayed out. Um, oh, you're not able. Well, are you, are you, does your node have an effect applied to it? Okay. Because the, the settings. These settings are only for. Yeah, so these settings are for the effects that are applied in this effects library. Yeah, a colors. And then the regular nodes with your color grade, these won't have, as you can see, my settings option is grayed out. So that's why those are different. Back there. Yeah. So the question is, why don't I use AG, you said, why don't I use AGX for color grading inside of Blender? Inside of Blender. Um, so yeah, there is, I, so I like to do color grading in DaVinci Resolve. Um, and so when we're going between Blender and Resolve, um, you want to export in a format like EXR and inherently that's not going to be able to have that AGX transform applied to that file. Um, so AGX is doing something called tone mapping, more technically speaking. Um, and so that's kind of what we're recreating here in Resolve um, with this tone mapping functionality. Uh, there is a way to more closely bring AGX into Resolve with uh, some DCTL stuff. If you, so Gleb Alexandrov, if I'm saying his name right, Creative Shrimp, he has a really good free course about Blender to Resolve, and he goes over how to get AGX recreated in Resolve. But long story short, I just like doing color grading in Resolve. So. So you want never export from Blender anyway without being Resolve? I mean, you could totally, you don't have to use Resolve, right? Um, yeah, if I'm going to do any sort of serious color grading, I like to do that personally in, in Resolve. So. Yeah, I would I would be exporting an EXR sort of format. Yeah. Yep. So you're saying right yeah hmm yeah you're doubling you're saying if you're if you're doing that first step then you're adding a lot of extra Files. Yeah, I mean, you totally could. Um, yeah, that's a, a limitation of like the default color configuration in Blender. Um, but I've totally like, yeah, if I use Nuke, I will oftentimes skip that first step of uh, doing the color transform and resolve and just bring in the, the file from the camera file into Nuke and click on the vlog transform. So you're right, it does add an extra step and extra file size. If you're working on a large project, it could be impractical. Yeah, good question. In the back.
Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. So he said, uh, in doing product vis visualization, sometimes you'll have specific colors that should match closely in a render to represent a product or a brand correctly. Um, yeah, that, that is one reason that Blender recently has added this new view transform called Kronos PBR Neutral. I honestly, I haven't tested it much, but as far as I know, this is to help uh, preserve those RGB values, those colors that you're choosing in your render um, so that they match more closely to uh, you know, your brand values. Um, but yeah, that, that comes down to the view transform that you're using and just choosing one that would preserve those better. Um, but there's probably better information on that topic. I don't really, haven't come into that issue as much in my work. I know OpenEXR is not final, it's an intermediate file system. But I like to use those multi layers, you know, crypto map masks and everything. I would just like to do a little tweaks here and there in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. But I would uh, like it to look as the AGX transform because uh, throughout the whole project, I'm working with the AGX view transform as I'm looking, you know, in the live view cycles. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, then. When I uh, export OpenXR and then get to Photoshop, you know, and adjust the gamma, it, it still doesn't look the same. And I'm always like, ah, that's not, not really what I wanted. And th throughout the whole project, I'm just working with the AGX. So my question is really, like, what kind of all operations I would need to do in Photoshop to get the AGX look? And if it's possible to, like, uh, store it in a cube file or some lookup table or, mm. or something, I realized that I have to correct for gamma with inverted value. It's like one over 2.2 and not 2.2 and all this stuff. Mm. But I'm never able to get it done to the same look. And so yeah, I would like to do that like very fast, but I'm not able to do it at all actually. So yeah. do you have any, uh, yeah, what do you do that? I, so the question was, how do you get the AGX view transform in working in Photoshop essentially? Yeah, um, I've never tried that. I, I don't know. <laughs> Um, maybe there's a lot you could create and load. Uh, I don't know, technically speaking, like data wise, if that would hurt your data. So I'm going to point out Nathan up here. If you see him walking around, you should ask him your color questions as well. He's, he's taught me all I know. So if I said anything wrong, blame him. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I did know. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Um, but yeah, I don't know, if, but we can talk afterwards. Um, I've never, never tried that myself. If, yeah, for those of you that didn't hear, Nathan said, short answer, probably a pain in the ass. So, in the, yeah. Do you run into issues where your monitor has a custom color profile that's not standard for SRGB? Do you want to create something for the internet? Are you facing issues that what you're seeing on your monitor might not match what is out there? How would you deal with that position? Yeah, so he's, uh, the question was, if your monitor has a kind of non-standard color space other than sRGB, how do you kind of handle that uh, when you're trying to grade something accurately and then it looks different when you upload it somewhere? Um, so yeah, I, here I have my, my MacBook and this is what I work on and it's a, an XDR display. And um, I honestly still haven't figured that out like perfectly. My, my colors, like for those of us that have worked on Apple monitors. Um, I think there's a, there, there's a better way than I'm currently using, but uh, yeah, it depends on the software that you're using. Like in DaVinci Resolve, I know um, when I'm exporting with this display, I will usually say I'm making a final export. I will usually select a color space tag like Rec. 709 and Rec. 709A, which is kind of funky and uh, I once knew why I did this, and now I just know that I do this. Um, 
but yeah, that's, that's a trickier question. Um, also ask Nathan. <laughs> any, any other questions? Let's see what the time is. Oh, we're up. Sorry, but we can talk after this. I want to let other people get in here and get set up. So thank you guys. This was fun.